also if you're school teachers you can uh, or any teachers you can let us know which organization or institute you work with Yeah, we're live, Amrita. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the session. We'll be shortly starting. So meanwhile, you can drop in from where you're joining and if you're uh, associated with some schools or any uh, nature education organization, you can uh, even mention that in the chat. Amruta, yeah. Uh, perhaps to keep everybody's internet intact, uh, we can request um, the non-part non-panelists uh, yeah. to turn their videos off. Yeah. So everyone, just a request to request so that if, if everyone's internet is working properly and things, uh, participants can. I'll keep the videos off and we'll just have the panelists videos. So that would be there. So hello everyone, welcome to the second uh, session of the Birding's Buddy online uh, session that Early Birds conducting. Uh, today with us we have three teachers, uh, Nikta, Nikita and Geeta, who would be interacting with us uh, for the next uh, hour or so. So, most of you might be knowing uh, about uh, early bird, but I'll just give a quick introduction to early bird uh, for the ones who are not very familiar with. So uh, at early bird, our mission is to connect uh, kids, with children with uh, nature, especially through birds and through ma make it accessible to everyone through various interactive uh, educational strategies and through maybe games and uh, uh, very interesting nature walks. So 
how do we do that? We make we work with content, training, and outreach. With content, we have uh, various uh, pocket guides of uh, different states around. Uh, we have posters and uh, various games that you can uh, also freely download from our website. I'll share the link uh, in the chat. And in training, we uh, train uh, educators to conduct uh, and use such material to connect kids with nature. And the session is also part of uh, such uh, like a uh, extension of uh, the network that was built during uh, the training session. And in outreach, we have uh, the Young Birders uh, Network, which uh, directly involves with the children. So just an introduction to the um, uh, webinar series as well. So uh, last year, we did uh, six uh, uh, such uh, webinars wherein we talked about nature education and uh, different, different aspects of engaging with nature. Uh, and we are again restart we have restarted this since April 2023. And uh, the main focus of this series would largely be on different challenges that educators face while uh, conducting such activities or uh, having kids introducing it to kids and having them engage uh, in the long term. So you can go check out our um, uh, YouTube uh, uh, page, uh, YouTube channel as well, wherein you can check out the playlist to uh, see the previous uh, session. This session will also be uh, soon uploaded, uh, the recording of this uh, onto the same, into the same playlist. So yeah, so I'm welcoming all the panelists and participants here for the session. And today's session would be moderated by Abhisheka, who's uh, also working with Early Bird. And we have uh, Misha here, who's also from the Early Bird team. So I'll hand over the session to Abhisheka. Uh, thank you, Amrita. Uh, a warm welcome to you all uh, for taking off time during the weekend and joining us uh, for the session. And a warm welcome to the three speakers, uh, Snigda, Geeta, and Nikita. Um, yeah, so uh, teachers are often overwhelmed with curriculum demands and uh, which also leaves very little opportunity uh, to connect children to nature. But in this, uh, in this session, uh, uh, let us jointly explore ways of uh, incorporating nature uh, education into school curriculum. Uh, so before, um, uh, without further delay, I would like to invite the speakers to briefly introduce yourself. Um, uh, if you can, uh, you know, introduce about uh, briefly about your work and uh, the kind of school that you're associated with uh, and the, uh, the location that you come from. Uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Gita first to uh, give an introduction. Yeah, thank you, Abhisheka and Amrita, for having me on this panel. Um, yeah, I am Gita, and um, I teach in a private school in Bangalore. Uh, we cater to yes, uh, a group of um, it's a school for. Uh, uh, the general public, but we do have uh, some children from the underprivileged background also in our school. A certain uh, quota is kept for them. So we have them also in our classes. I uh, teach uh, children from the age of 11 to 15 uh, in the middle school uh, years. And I feel that's the best age, you know, to tap their potential and get them interested in hobbies and things like that. So I find that age very, very intriguing. And um, yeah, and the school is uh, located in Tipsandra. So that's about me and my school. And I've been working in this school for the past 27 years. So I'm there for a long, long time. Yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you, Gita. Yeah, you, you, so you carry with you a whole uh, a very long experience of teaching. Um, uh, okay, next, may I invite uh, Nikita to introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nikita Pimbre Savan. I'm founder and principal of Rishi Valmiki Eco School, which is based at Mumbai. We run the school for the children who come from underprivileged background, where like financially challenging background and the school is started for them to create a space where they feel loved, safe and get quality education. Um, our school is the eco school where just to give you a brief is we have wildlife education as an integral part of the school apart from all the other subjects. So that's it in short about our school. Thanks Nikita. We'll hear more about your work. Uh... Uh, in the next few minutes of the session. And uh, Snigda, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. I'm Snigda, and uh, I'm a biologist by training, but I've now been teaching for about close to a decade. I am now working as a science and nature educator in Goa. It's a small um, um, alternative but private a learning space called the Learning Center. I teach um, everyone from five, year, five years old to 16 years old. And uh, most of these children are come from the city, are city people. But also after school, I uh, do a lot of outreach programs. And these are mostly for children who are from the community and a slight, of a less slightly uh, lesser privileged background. So... Yeah, this is an alternative school, which means that we don't have a defined curriculum, which is very strict. So there's a lot of flexibility and we can play around quite a bit. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you, Snigda. Uh, a small note to the audience here. So the way we'll go about today is that uh, we have a few questions to the panelists. Um, and then uh, while uh, while the session is going on, uh, uh, since uh, you're all muted, you could also put down your questions in the chat. And um, uh, we will have a QA and a session where uh, uh, you could uh, ask your questions to the panelists directly. And uh, that's how we'll go about it. So uh, but to begin with, um, uh, so often uh, it's quite known that often nature education programs are conducted as uh, in the school as part of the extracurricular activities. They're not generally incorporated into the school curriculum. Uh, but then uh, you all have been uh, integrating nature-based activities into the curriculum. Uh, how do you go about doing this? Uh, uh, it would also be nice if you can uh, share some practical tips and examples for the teachers uh, out here. Um. Um. Would you, who would you like to go first? Uh, any of you could begin. Gita, would you like to start off? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so ours is an ICSC. Uh, we follow the ICSC curriculum, which is really heavy. You know, even uh, there's a lot of volume to be completed every year, a lot of portions. So uh, it, is, it is a challenge, uh, you know, uh, including nature education as a regular kind of uh, subject in the curriculum. Uh, so what we alternately do is we try to integrate it in our subject teaching, uh, try to bring in certain questions or examples related to nature in our teaching. Um, for, for example, uh, since I am interested in birding, I do bring in birding examples into my science questions. So as I had um, mentioned that in physics, I teach physics uh, and um, the, to teach the relationship between pressure and surface area, you know, how it, um, when the surface area is um, uh, more, the pressure becomes less. And uh, then uh, I asked the children about, you know, how the feet of the birds vary and which are the birds that can actually walk on leaves and without sinking. Yeah, so the this Jakana's feet was something that um, I had asked in one of the questions in my question paper. Uh, that uh, giving you know uh, the pictures of various uh, feet of birds, 
I had um, asked them which of these can actually walk on water. And then they had to come up with the relationship between, you know, uh, surface area of contact and pressure and uh, and answer that question. So, you know, uh, if you, but uh, the thing is, the teacher must also have the knowledge of nature. Otherwise, it's a little difficult to integrate. So, a teacher who's very uh, keen on nature, interested, committed, I think, can bring in nature, however difficult or, or however however many constraints there might be in teaching, it can be brought in into the curriculum. Uh, that's very interesting because uh, usually when we think of nature education, we kind of think of subjects like biology, but then uh, you've brought in birds into a physics uh, yes. class. That, that's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, Snigda, fact, would you... Uh, yeah, please. Sorry. sorry. Uh, in fact, there's a lesson also in science on birds in the lower classes. So okay. there also you can do a lot with birds, you know, uh, from their uh, feathers to their uh, beaks and feet and uh, all kinds of projects are done when that lesson is taught in this. So Thank you. Snigda, would you like to go next? Yes, sure. Uh, with with me, we have uh, a month allotted to activities and which are not so related to curriculum. So we do a whole nature immersion in the first um, month that we start school. Uh, in that we do a lot of nature related stuff and birding walks becomes one of them. But this is also coinciding with the monsoon. So a lot, lot of times birds are not out there. So we do activities inside. But um, um, in this is when we play a lot of I play a lot of games with them uh, and this is where we use the uh, the early bird flash the flashcards quite a bit and then I just make up a whole set of like every time we play a new game and then we complicate it a little bit and then I tell these children once they played this game a couple of times um, yeah so you can see that we're doing a Chinese whisper of birds in the first one and then in the second one we're describing uh, we've seen these birds, these flashcards, and then it's like a Pictionary or like one group is describing this bird has long legs. It's And then the other group has to guess. Uh, and so we make up all these games uh, and it's a lot of fun and they learn about birds in the process. Um, so this is one. And incorporating it in the curriculum is slightly difficult, but I do it more consciously um, when I'm reading I mean, what I do is I read a lot of books, actually, with the younger kids. And so one of my favorites is uh, Bird Business. And uh, children of all ages can enjoy, can enjoy this. It's really funny. And uh, we also then take this to the art teacher and we can collaborate quite a bit in my, uh, in my school. So then we might learn about birds and then convert that into a comic strip. Then there's Talim, Mamu and me. Uh, this is one, this is a story that talks about um, this girl who has uh, birders all around her, but she can't recognize birds. And then slowly, 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 how she gets on this journey of discovering that birding is not scary, although all these bird names are so scary. But um, so this is one of the introducing books to birding um, that I read with all my children. There's a whole bunch of books on, there's on, um, on story, uh, on story weaver. Uh, and so whenever I have access to, or Pratham Books has a lot of books as well. So whenever I have, I have access to a screen, then I have, there are about eight to nine books for all ages, starting from four to 15. Uh, we read those. For the older children, there are journal articles that I pick up. So Sanctuary Asia sometimes has a lot of um, uh, inform uh, new information on birds that comes up. There was a recent article about hornbills and forests in Goa. And I read that with the class 11 children. Um, and then, so that brings environment or uh, current affairs into this also. Um, so this is how to integrate it in curriculum. But what I do most um, naturally, I think, is what we as teachers call teachable moments. When something interesting happens, you just catch that and then you somehow introduce them to birding or bird related things. And I have one very interesting story um, 
one of my children here had a farm, has a farm where they have turkey and uh, chicken. And um, when his mom was cutting, was uh, cutting one of the one of the turkeys, I think, to eat for like one of the big festivals, they found that they had eggs inside. Uh, and so he was very disturbed, but he got he was also so fascinated. So he got it to school. And uh, we saw them and there were eggs of different sizes and the shell wasn't complete. Um, but anyway, we studied them and then they said, okay, now how do we make them turn to chicks? Maybe they can turn to chicks. So then they created a little nest and they put it inside a stool and then covered it. And then we spoke about, okay, what do they need now? And they were like, they need to keep warm. Then we figured we need to keep them in the sun, but that's not warm enough. What is the ideal temperature they need? And then they kept it for a few days and they saw the egg shrinking, 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 becoming smaller. And they said, okay, now... And then we took a light, we took a torchlight and we shone it through that torch, through that egg. And you could see that there is something inside, but it wasn't growing. But I took that as a moment to discuss uh, how eggs grow, how chicken grows, you know, how like a bird grows from an egg. So we had a whole developmental biology session. And then from there, we went on to how tadpoles grow. And then from there, we went on to how human babies grow. And uh, it was... Uh, it, it was quite an interesting time for everyone. And then eventually we realized that, you know, this egg is not growing and then it it will, would have probably died. And so uh, then they organized a burial and everybody went outside and buried these eggs and they said, you know, REP egg. <laughs> and it was like a whole event. But so these, these kind of small moments can also then, you know, get into curriculum, become about birds, also be integrated with a whole bunch of topics. Yeah, that uh, that was a very sweet story uh, where kids can could actually learn in uh, real life the development of a bird and uh, yeah and, and and I agree that you know a lot of games and uh, activities can be quite uh, good to in, in, uh, introduce birds to children. Uh, next, I'll move on to Nikita. Would you like to share some tips? Yes, hello. First, I want to begin with what the example Gita gave. Uh, it was just amazing to incorporating physics with nature. Like hardly anybody would think for higher grades to incorporate like that. And this is possible because we are inspired by nature. Everything what we are doing, learning, we are inspired by nature. It's just that we are going away from it now. And it's very important for teachers to connect the children back because learning will be effective if we connect it with nature and it will be there for a lifetime. So there are many teachers and the chat box I read that they're from primary section. Uh, I would like to give an example from a primary section. So in state board, uh, in third standard, there is a lesson of civics, which is about the family. So where the lesson talks about the different types of family we have, a joint family, extended family, then um, single father family, single mother family. So Teaching about this is one part where they know the names of the families. But one more step ahead, we have to go that if some children are staying in single parent family, they should be very comfortable even talking about that and shouldn't feel bad about it. And my children come from a background where they cannot talk about this. So I have so many examples from nature to give children and I narrate a story about it. So when we talk about joint family, we talk, talk about Asiatic lions family. When we talk about nuclear family, we have beautiful example of Hornbill, uh, so Malabar Pied Hornbill's example I use. Single father family, we have seahorse. Single mother family, I use sloth bear. And extended family, I use Asiatic elephant family. And when we talk about these examples, we also talk about it's not about how big or how small is a family. It's about how much you love each other in the family. And my experience says that when we taught this before, children were not opening out. But when I use this example, my children opened out about this. They shared their feelings. So it is not only giving them the knowledge. It is also about the life skills they are learning, the values they are learning, and the emotions, basically. So this is one example. And there are many examples of prime, for primary section. Like to teach Vibgyor, you have different colored birds. For each color, you have a bird. You can use that. Uh, for shelter of animals, we have different animals. Like for harvester ant, you have a harvester nest pagoda nest so different types of nest are there way which you can use for to teach shelter of animals we don't have to stick to only human shelter so this kind of connect helps a lot 
so this is how actually we can incorporate each and every lesson respiration sikha rahe senses so when you're teaching senses we talk about the senses of cat family so every topic can be actually connected and we are doing it in the school even maths as i said can even in the maths if you're giving the mathematic expression like this many uh, animals are there uh, after having project tiger the number of tiger increased by this this number so now addition and subtraction can be taught by using the real numbers which are present so children learn about the environment conservation projects also so these are some examples i can give from primary section how we can incorporate wildlife with curriculum uh those are very useful points nikita and uh, especially again uh, here too like you know uh, uh, using um, uh, nature activities in a civics class is something that not many uh, think about uh, but but these are very nice examples uh, actually uh, again coming back to geeta you did mention that you know to uh, to plan such activities one also has to be um, knowledgeable about one has to have knowledge about birds and other uh, uh, natural world to to bring in these examples into your regular uh, classroom uh, do you have any advice on how can teachers who know nothing about say birds uh, go about Uh, uh gaining this knowledge so that they could in turn uh teach uh, uh bring this into their classroom well we have early bird to help us <laughs> in fact uh, one of our teachers have gone to early bird in the past for a training session and uh, she was really impressed with the knowledge she had gained and she uh, she was helping me with the nature club in our school so she she was quite influenced by it and hopefully she will use those examples in her classrooms so that's one way and uh, we have um, i think teacher training should be done by organizations like yours to bring in that knowledge and i think you're doing a great job of it we also have uh, people like you know people for animals pfa Uh, which goes to schools and uh, addresses students and teachers so we've been having a series of talks by them coming to our school and addressing children mainly on wildlife in the city so how you can observe you know the wildlife around your house and uh, uh, become more observant and be more empathetic towards nature so these are the things uh, they have been trying to inculcate in the students and uh, teachers are also a part of these sessions so i'm sure they benefit from it yeah thank you and uh, for those uh, those of you who don't know about uh, early birds um, training sessions because geeta mentioned early bird because also uh, amrita uh, mentioned in the introduction that uh, uh, we also conduct a lot of training programs for teachers and uh, other educators in taking children to uh, Uh, in connecting children to birds and so early bird produces a whole lot of materials that uh, uh, resource materials and there are recorded webinars that teachers could use to learn about birds um uh, do uh, snigda and nikita do you have anything to add here um and go with like what geeta said as e bird also has like lot of material teachers need to go through the material one should attend more nature walks wherever it's possible because going in the field is very important and any subject teacher nature is for everyone there is no only science teacher or evs teacher have to learn this nature is for everyone and it's mesmerizing so we should just learn keep learning uh snigta do you have anything to add or um not really i think um yes read resources but even if you don't know the names of birds one can always watch behavior and uh, start with describing and just um giving words to what you see observing a little bit more and over time you learn i am still learning i don't know all my birds i don't know most of them but children sometimes are like oh look blue bird and then we like which one could it be and uh, yeah thank you 
so uh, something that we hear from teachers when we uh, work with teachers or train teachers is that, uh, I mean, teachers do have several uh, challenges um, in incorporating nature education. Uh, one is the constraint of time because, um, you know, they already have the syllabus to cover. And then if they have to design uh, programs uh, uh, which incorporates nature activities, they have to kind of, um, you know, uh, again, spend a lot of time to gather materials to, to kind of facilitate this discussion, uh, along with completing the subject portions. Uh, how do you all overcome this uh, problem of time constraint? Snigda, would you like to take this up first? Uh, no, I'll actually pass it to the rest because my school is a little different and I, I have more time than others. So, um, I would add here, uh, as I said, it, it is like process and it can be part of the process and not as a separate thing. Like we have to teach wildlife or nature as a separate thing. So as Gita also said, we can directly connect it with the curriculum. So you don't need like a lot of time to teach it separately. That is one. Second, what we do at, at the school is all the festivals which we celebrate. In each festival, you can connect with the nature. So this is how we incorporate nature there. Again, we don't take children for picnic. We take them for the nature trail, field trip. So wherever there is, again, in our school, in the annual day, we have wildlife theme. So everything is, so now next year it's Assam theme. So we will be talking about Assam culture, but as well as a wildlife of Assam. So this is how you can incorporate every activity. So this is the photograph of our, one of our annual day. Mammals was the theme. So I, And children learn about science also here. Biology they learn. Geography they learn. So all subjects are incorporated in this when you are talking about wildlife. So this is how we can go ahead. This is the one way we can go ahead. Yeah, um, as I told you, um, our school is an ICSE school and uh, we have a very, very uh, heavy syllabus to finish over the year. So we normally take it uh, on Saturdays or we have a nature club. So in the nature club, what we do is we meet early morning at the location, maybe a lake or a park. And all the children come there, whoever is part of the club, they come there directly at around 6.30 or 7 at the most. And then uh, we take them around and then we are back in school by the time the first uh, period is over. So this is one of our uh, trips to a lake near my house called uh, Dodnakundi Lake. And uh, in this photograph, you can see Anirudh. He was uh, part of our nature club. He was, I think, in, the, in class five or five or six at the most. And now he's a budding wildlife photographer and he volunteers with Early Bird. He's had, um, he's even been invited abroad to, for a workshop. So he's doing great in uh, uh, birds and uh, bird related uh, work you know, and photography. So there are some success stories that come out of these endeavors. Uh, so we used to take the children to the lake and then uh, if, you, if you see that, uh, poster in their hands actually uh, I got them printed uh, you know I got so many copies printed for the children because at that time I didn't know about early bird resources so I just uh, picked up birds that would definitely be spotted in that lake because I knew what birds were there and then I made a kind of chart of those birds and then gave it to each child and then they we asked them to spot and then I note down the names whereas we had as we uh, told them what those birds were. So that was the way we went about it. Yeah. So uh, other than that, we've taken children to Lal Bagh and uh, other locations, you know, on Saturdays mainly. Uh, but the nature club would happen on a working day, but early in the morning so that we are back in time for school. The first period is allotted for the club. So the other clubs like uh, maybe a science club or a music club would meet in the first period of the day. But we would meet much earlier and come back by the time the first period was over. So we didn't miss any classes in that way. That's how we ran the club. Then we used to have gardening also. And then we have a lot of guest lectures. 
over the year. In fact, now Environment Day is on Monday. The entire week we have activities slated for our students. Uh, so they are making uh, bags and they're going to uh, gift it to the vendors, fruit vendors in our locality. And uh, they're going to give them, since this year it's beat plastic pollution, they're going to uh, give, give them some placards which encourage customers to bring uh, their own bags and things like that. So we are working on uh, various ideas and ways to incorporate a love for nature. Uh, and um, yeah, and that's the way we are trying to bring in nature into our curriculum. Because it is difficult to have a you know period allotted every week for nature study, and it's uh, it's not practical. Yeah, I that's really true. wonderful to know. Yes, yeah, yes, Nikita, do you have anything you more add to add? Something interesting to what Gita said. Uh, I just recollected now. So we have something, uh, some games which are designed, which we use in PT lecture also. So all old games are transformed, which are connected with wildlife to give you an example, which we played today, hopscotch. So we have one to 10 numbers on the hopscotch. We must have played in the childhood. So now that for every number, we have one animal assigned, like for one, number one, it is one horned rhinoceros. For number two, for num example, for number four, it is Chausinga. For number nine, it's Pitta, which is now Ranga. So this is how for every number we have different animals. And we play this with primary kids and also secondary then uh, there is one game in Marathi, we call it Dongar and Mati. <laughs> so mountain uh, and I think water. So we have completely transformed into a territory game. So you have to just catch the territory. And then every animal's different um, uh, territory is mentioned on that on those blocks. So this is how we have transformed PT lectures also and connected with wildlife. So these are simple things which, which we can try to incorporate. Yeah, I think Nikita and Snigda are doing very interesting things. Uh, <laughs> but in a formal school like ours, you know, doing things in the curriculum. I mean, during the school day is a little difficult, except for having, you know, guest lectures and even classrooms we take outside into the garden. Uh, have a class, you know, a biology class happens outside, uh, showing them the way philotaxy and, uh, you know, all those things are done outdoors, uh, but beyond that, it's difficult to, and we do it even in our uh, assessments. We try to bring in a bit of nature in our assessments. Yeah, yeah but uh, I mean, despite the challenges, you all still manage to somehow fit in uh, nature into into your uh, you know school curriculum, whether it's, uh, uh, it's celebrating different festivals or uh, uh, use, I mean, using, uh, uh, nature clubs in the uh, or science clubs in the cl uh, in the school uh, that's really wonderful to know uh, so another challenge that again some of the teachers face is there are schools where they may not have access to outdoors not all school have you know campuses uh, or there are also um, uh, challenges of the school authorities not giving permission for the teachers to take the children outdoors uh, have you faced such a situation and um, what is your uh, advice for such teachers? May I take that? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, as far as the school and management are concerned, uh, they, at least in our case, they've always encouraged teachers who have, you know, wanted to uh, inculcate different interests in students. So if they find that a teacher is committed, in fact, I think any management would do that. If a teacher is really sincere and committed, I'm sure they will encourage the teacher because every school wants their students to be the best. So they will provide every opportunity possible to you know, uh, expose their children to various experiences. So that way, um, I think um, if the teacher shows commitment, I think permission can never be a problem. And she has to be a little persevering also. <laughs> um, I would add to this, Gita correctly said um, that it is possible. Uh, another thing is like even we run the school in the four rented rooms. So we don't have any premises where we can go. But in the same... Uh, Nikita, sorry to interrupt. If you can be a little louder. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. 
so i was saying that even we run the school in the four rented rooms so we also don't have playground or a proper premises where we can take children but uh, we have started with uh, nature trails in the backyard there are in the same uh, road there are around uh, 9 10 trees you know just little away from the school but uh, even in the limited number of trees which we have the students are learning a lot i think we just have to start and we see we also see many common birds um, in the vicinity which generally children were not spotting before like copper smith barbet or sun bird children were not uh, spotting this before but now after regular nature trails in the vicinity only even in that limited space children are spotting these birds so it is possible if we try uh, and with some expertise from someone like you or the organization it helps a lot if i can just add to what nikita said backyard birding even for us is is a huge hit and we can step outside and even you know walk along the road uh, and we end up and we go with the early bird pocket guides and um, it's it's you do end up spotting about 10 15 different kinds of birds and sometimes these children take these pocket guides home and even on the way home or at home they're able to find these and if even that doesn't happen sometimes i'll make bingos for them where i will it, we may not have specific birds but you might have a bird behavior bingo so a bird eating or a bird with long legs or something like that and then then they, this will be over the weekend where they'll just you know tick 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 what they found so that's also an option i mean i cheat i send homework but <laughs> sometimes that works and i have one tip to give those schools you know which have uh, no outdoors at all uh, have a lot of uh, talks by guest speakers there's so many volunteers who are willing to come and talk to the children i gave you the example of pfa then you have your ex students uh, i ha- i'm fortunate to have a few ex students who are you know willing to come and speak to the children so we must use these opportunities uh, we have experts in the field even in not just birds even in uh, uh, nature conservation you know uh, we have people like odet katrak who is who's very popular in the bangalore circuit uh, as a uh, as a conservationist so she has come and addressed our children against the use of uh, plastics and then we've had dr shanti who spoken to our children about composting and uh, waste segregation and all that so we can have you know various people coming and talking and there's so many organizations where people are willing to come and do these things at no cost at all so it's just up to us to take the trouble to invite them and uh, yeah facilitate that's it yeah those were very useful trips uh, to in, in addition um, there are also a lot of uh, games that could be played indoor games and creative activities that can be uh, done indoors um in fact uh, early bird uh, has has some of these resources uh, early bird also has compiled a lot of resource materials that uh, educators across india have developed and amrita will be sharing the link in the chat to our website you could uh, check out the resources page um and uh, you know ma- ma- a lot of these materials are freely av- available in fact uh, some of these games are also freely downloadable that one can print and use inside the classroom uh, and of course art even even in you know forms like role play or sketching uh, all those could be done indoors even if there's no outdoor space available and like nidha mentioned uh, you know children can go back home or or on the way home they could also observe nature even if the school cannot provide that kind of environment okay so we did speak about the challenges and um, uh, also i want to uh, ask this question to nikita like have you had any uh, because of the kind of children that you work with have you had any um, issues with um, uh, uh, with regard to gender like Uh, taking uh, female children outdoors have there been any kind of opposition from the parents and how do you go about dealing with this yes definitely abhishekha uh, i uh, i work with the children who come from a uh, challenging uh, financial background and definitely there uh, sending girls outdoor 
uh, is not allowed immediately. Um, I have children uh, who come and tell me that, ma'am, we are not allowed to go to play on the ground. So only when they come to the school, they get access to the outdoor activities if we provide. So that's the problem. But now I want to tell you a success story. Like since so many years, we are conducting this activity, explaining parents that why it is important and it is connected with academics. That is important. You have to tell them that it is connected with academics, then they allow. Now, my one of my child has been chosen from Sanctuary Asia as a tiger ambassador. So that is one of the success story. My ex-students are conducting nature walks and side by side, they're taking pursuing their education. So this has become a medium for them to earn money at the same time pursue their education and that's the impact nature education has made on these children especially on girls i'm very proud of them so this is one of my student pralad he's conducting a nature walk so this is a very regular uh, practice so today only we had a program where our children conducted a nature walk for adults so this happens at least once in a month where students give education to adults who come and visit the school and this has helped children a lot to develop their life skills also, apart from their education or knowledge. That's that's such a wonderful story to hear. Uh, since since you mentioned success stories, uh, uh, I think uh, I my, my next question is related to that. Uh, what, according to you, uh, are the benefits of incorporating nature education into the school curriculum? Like what what kind of, uh, I mean, uh, Nikita, you did mention this example, but uh, uh, if you have others and also uh, uh, asking Geeta and Snigda, uh, what outcomes have you observed in your students with this kind of intervention in the classroom? Should I go first? Shall I yes, go first? Geeta, please go ahead, Geeta. Yeah. So, uh, see, there are plenty of benefits in uh, introducing children to nature very early in their you know, childhood because they become observant, they become empathetic, they learn to appreciate you know, what is uh, around them, nature, and they become ambassadors, you know, nature ambassadors as they grow older. And uh, they influence their peers. See, even if we, we are able to change the attitude of a few children, they have an immense influence on their peer group. And as a whole, they become more sensitive to nature. And I think that's the best way we can go forward to conserve what we have left with us. Yeah. I think becoming very observant, uh, that's one thing when they look, look at birds, you know, when you look for birds, you actually become observant about many things, not just birds. Your, your eyes become very keen. You uh, tend to notice more things than other people do, you know. And I've uh, seen that, I don't know, uh, even with uh, my limited experience, I, I feel that a person who does bird birding uh, is able to observe a lot of things other than birds also pretty well. That's right, yeah. I was saying the same thing that the, even I have observed that the observation skills of the children have increased a lot. Um, attention span has increased, especially for primary section. So this is my observation. Create a so lot of life skills, like even creativity. So a lot of children who are into painting. So that has developed. The skill has developed. Or the creativity has developed. So a lot of life skills have developed apart from their knowledge base. That's my observation about kids. I would completely agree with uh, Gita and Nikita, and I would just add that this, I think, gives them, um, it gives them other things to um, to pay attention to also. Like, I think a lot of children, um, this is a good way to spend time, to look at birds, to find to find joy in nature. And I think slowly, it, they start empathizing um, they feel more love for nature. So it's not just birds, it's also caterpillars, butterflies, everything becomes exciting, you know, like if, so we've had sessions where if I'm, we, we're having a session outside, there's a bird who's singing, we'll stop, we'll listen to it. Or, you know, there's a jumping spider that jumps on you, we'll stop and then we'll see how it jumps. And so you start to slowly derive joy 
out of these small things you see every day. And I think that's also what makes people notice that, oh, the migratory birds have come. You can hear the pitta suddenly. Or uh, this year they haven't come. Or look, so many birds now, now is a time to, I think it just makes you notice seasons, notice flowering it, a lot more. And a lot of these children grow up to become, as uh, Gita rightly said, they just become more aware individuals who are more, who, who know what their actions could mean, could imply in, in terms of, um, they're more environmentally conscious, I think. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, empathy is so important for, uh, especially when a child is growing up and uh, uh, nature education is such a wonderful way of introducing empathy to kids and also to have this connection to their surroundings and see the changes in the surroundings. Yeah, definitely agree. Uh, I see that uh, a lot of questions are coming in from the uh, audience. Um, so, so uh, there are questions on YouTube as well and on Zoom. Um, maybe uh, Amrita, would you like to read out the questions that were posted on YouTube? So there is one question uh, in the the chat itself by Nisha. Uh, the question says, while teaching children, is there any experience that you can share where parents or adults got interested in nature or birds? That's a very interesting question. Would any of you like to take it up? Uh, I, I won't say during teaching, but yes, uh, during our nature walks, parents do get very interested. And they also join in sometimes. They encourage their children. They find more opportunities to expose their children to you know, such uh, field trips. You know, that's how it builds up. When, when a little... Um, seed is sown in them then it just blossoms over the years and the, uh, when the parents are also a part of it it really grows uh, very fast and the hobby becomes a passion in no time yeah i have a story to share uh, when once i was sitting in the uh, office or my staff room and suddenly some of my children from eighth ninth standard came running towards me that ma'am, you have to come with me right now outside the school gate. And uh, there are people who are chopping the trees. So I went with them. They were not chopping the trees, but it's a regular practice of BMC, Municipal Corporation, that they chop the some branches before rainy season. So I told kids that it's a regular practice. They are not chopping the trees. So one of my child said, ma'am, they cannot because the branch, the church, they are going to chop the branch where copper smith barbet nest every time. And this is what their observation is. I have not taught them. I have never told them, Ki, do this or don't do this. It's what they have learned because now they are in love with the nature. This is what they have observed. So I think this is one of the beautiful story I have with me. I have one um, that, that's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I have one that's not about birds, but it's about uh, moths and butterflies. And uh, the, we had the moth week for the first time last uh, in 2022, where we called parents and children at night and we put up a sheet uh, to look at moths and butterflies. And a lot of parents had never, and we then we had a small presentation to tell people what moths are. But a lot of grandparents were there and parents were there and they'd never done this before. And then after they went, they realized that they can do it at home. You just need a light um, on a plain wall. And since then, I think slowly, slowly, what happens is that children start observing these things. They get very excited. They send it, they tell their parents. And I have now been getting stream, you know, like streams of photographs on WhatsApp because your parents can message me saying oh look these are eggs moths are laying eggs in our house or this is what's happening here so and these are all children go to parents so th these messages they come from parents and it you know from parents to grandparents to the in the immediate families it does spread in fact uh, recently just uh, i think it was in december uh, there were two great tits that had nested just outside a classroom window. 
and uh, these children had noticed it and then they were also excited and they said auntie which bird is it they call us auntie in our school teachers so uh, which uh, which bird is it and what so i <laughs> i had a nice uh, bird lesson with them for about 10 minutes on uh, how they were nesting and how they could observe and without disturbing the birds because it was just outside and these children you know when they get excited they don't know what they're doing <laughs> So anyway, yeah, that was a nice session we had. Thanks for sharing these stories. They're so lovely. <laughs> uh, Amrita, are there any other questions from the audience? So there are a lot of comments that have come on YouTube and everyone's been sharing their experiences, how they have incorporated. I'll just check. If there are any yeah if there's questions. anything interesting that you would like to read out uh unless there's yeah. a question that we can take so yeah this is i guess so there's this one comment from youtube that says that uh i have also lecture by ria sarkar she is also incorporated uh, uh nature and birth something into English literature with deforestation. So the uh, chapter was on Henry and uh, Henry the chameleon, and they were told about insects, birds, and wild animals in the city. So that's one example that was there on. And then, so I don't see a lot of questions. So we can maybe ask the teachers who joined the session to maybe unmute and ask questions if they have any. Yeah, if there, if there are teachers out here and if you have any specific uh, uh, question that you would like to ask the speakers, please, yeah, you, uh, can, you could raise you can, your hand. And we can unmute you too. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, uh, if, if uh, uh, I mean, those of you who want to leave early, we have a feedback form, uh, a very short feedback form, which I'll uh, ask Amrita to post in the chat box. And um, it won't take much of your time. So if you can, you know, uh, post uh, after the session, if you can quickly fill it up, it will help us plan our uh, future sessions. We also, if you are also a nature educator, we have a survey for nature educators to understand uh, um, you know, uh, what more uh, is required to fill the gap in nature education. So if you can also fill that survey form, it will be really, really helpful to uh, come up with new resource materials or training, uh, uh, whatever else is required to fill this gap in nature education. Um, uh, okay, as we, yeah. There's yes, no a question uh, that's being posted in the chat. Okay, yeah. So Apurva Patil asks, as a part of nature education, do you also add documentation and citizen science initiative part? Can you please share any example if you have? So. Any of you can maybe take. I, I mean, I don't know if I followed the question right, but yeah, nowadays we have uh, eBird platform, so we we do tell the you know some older children about eBird and things. But uh, otherwise, I'm not sure what the question meant. I mean, citizen science in the sense. I'm not sure what the question was. I mean, what? Apurva, maybe you can uh, raise your hand and we can unmute you. You can ask the question yourself. Apurva, are you here? Unable to unmute. I have requested uh, to unmute. You can try now. Hello. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, Apurva, you can yeah. ask the question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for such a lovely session on nature education. So, uh, like, my question was uh, mainly on the documentation part. So, like, as uh, the students observe so many things in and around school or their home, 
so do you also insist them uh, to take a part in citizen science or are there any ways that where they can get actively involved in the citizen science projects like uh, as an individual or through the school i hope uh, my question is now clear uh, as far as document at like may i answer this as far to the yes please kita yeah. rest of my knowledge yeah. uh, as far as documentation is concerned yes we when we go on a field trip we do ask them to take a few notes and you know but we don't formalize it as such because once you start you know it becomes a chore and then that enjoyment is lost from the whole process so we are very cautious about making everything into a written assignment at least and uh, you know we just let them enjoy the moment write down what they want to write down what they observe and uh, file it and keep it for their own record and uh, as far as documentation goes nowadays we are very good with the videos and photographs and things like that so that's i don't know i have i answered your question i don't know if i can add to that um we have um, there are these birding days where um, you have bird counts happening on those days what we do is we go with um, these small notebooks and we write down whatever we find and then i will compile them and put it on an, an ebird uh, on my personal ebird checklist uh, so we just compile whatever we found we find because otherwise um, either the older children you need cell phones or you need a device to uh to put in these details what the older children have started have taken up to quite uh, naturally is i naturalist and because it doesn't only involve birds but i've seen that slowly they'll start putting in data for uh, for goa for tide pooling for instance along the shores or there's a whole bunch of butterflies and caterpillars that they put bugs um even plants they find odd so they we do tell them about these things but then it more of the older children take these up or the younger ones will ask their parents for gadgets um but what we did do as a school is that we did a biodiversity survey around our uh, around our campus um and in that we actually ended up finding about um 30 35 40 birds around and the plants and animals but and then we made a school i naturalist account in which we started putting all of this information and i'm hoping over time this will grow to be quite interesting and people can keep adding on to it but i would again uh, this is for older children slightly over over class 8 9 and 10 i did it but there is a bird or there's a story on the early bird website actually about somebody um an educator who's been doing uh, who's been uh, who's i don't remember who this is but you can check the website um uh who goes with children quite regularly and they have an and uh, they put they compile a list and they put it on ebird and uh, they've actually been monitoring this for several years and have found interesting information on while when they analyze what all they find every year so i don't remember but actually snigda that you have you have given me a very good idea for a project for our students you know tracking the biodiversity around your school i think is a wonderful project idea and i think nikita is already doing it so yeah that's that's a very good uh, uh, example the naturalist and ebird and yes uh, snigda like you mentioned uh, uh, one of the good examples is the school in valparai where their english teacher encouraged them to do this bird monitoring and they have their own uh, uh, account ebird account where the teacher used to uh, add their lists into ebird and uh, I, i mean even season watch season watch works with a lot of school students where uh, students monitor the trees in their uh, campus so definitely children uh, the, uh, the older children can be uh, involved in citizen science uh, contribution uh, we are uh, uh, we are almost crossed 5 
Uh, if there are any uh, important questions, maybe we could take one or two if uh, if the teachers could type it in the chat. Yeah. And those of you who want to leave, please uh, fill the feedback form. And you can also take a look at the early bird um, uh, website for different resources that are available for teachers. Amrita, are there any more questions or? No, no questions in the chat. We but have someone raised their hand, us. so we can ask to unmute and ask. Okay, them. okay. We can take one or two questions if you're a teacher. Yes, um, uh, one Mr. Yeah. Dilip. Yeah. You can maybe unmute. Yeah, I've uh, requested. Okay, I think there's no. Okay, while Dilip is uh, figuring out the audio, I just want to add we've recently discovered this new app called BirdNet which is very good at identifying sounds. And that's what we use a lot in my class because children come and say, Blue, what is that bird? What is that bird? And then I take my phone and put the app on and they're able to identify that bird. That's a very cool new thing we've discovered. Thanks for that, Snita. So will be any such uh, relevant links or resources that the panelists have mentioned today we'll share it uh, in the description of the youtube uh, recording that will be uploaded so you can go there and check that out as well sorry uh, as a closing remark um, uh, do do any of you have any key takeaways for teachers uh, who want to implement nature based uh, Ex uh, experience and learning, uh, learning in their classroom, something that we haven't covered in this session and she would like to share. Well, uh, I would say if you're passionate about nature, nothing should stop you from taking it to your students. And I'm sure you'll find some way to do it. May not be within school hours, but outside school hours we can definitely find opportunities to take our children out and you know, you know, show them nature and uh, teach them to appreciate nature. <laughs> I would add to that, if you can find a buddy uh, in, your, in your school, a buddy teacher who might be teaching any other subject, it is a great idea to collaborate with them. So I love collaborating with the English teachers. We find interesting stories in the beginning of the year that are bird that have birds or animals in them. Or this year, I'm hoping to collaborate with the maths teacher and make some maps or do some geography and some graphs. Um, and then you don't have to do it alone. And it combines a whole bunch of subjects and it can be quite interesting. I would add into it, uh, very beautiful. Huh? This idea I like buddy system. Uh, one more thing is uh, we have already discussed this that you can take support, support of the material, resources, right people, educators, and then you are on your own to explore. So try to take support and explore. Yes, that support is so important. Uh, in fact, so which is why uh, Early Bird has, has also created this Birding Buddies Network, trying to bring together bird educators across the country. So we have a WhatsApp group where people can join, or um, uh, I mean, they could uh, if they don't want to be part of a WhatsApp. With the WhatsApp group is um, uh, uh, good where you can have direct discussions with other educators if you want some kind of support in terms of material or information um, or you could also just follow uh, early bird uh, 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 social media if you just want to know uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, resources early bird can provide but it would be really lovely to be part of the whatsapp group so there's learning from other educators as, as well and uh, thank you so much uh, Nikita, Gita and Snigda for sharing your experiences and uh, uh, tips uh, uh, here and uh, for so many of you uh, that you know you've taken out time on a weekend uh, 
uh, and then spent almost an hour with us. Uh, so uh, please do uh, fill out the feedback form. And uh, so these sessions happen once in two months. Uh, two months and um, uh, so please uh, uh, keep an eye out for the next session and uh, thank you thank you so much for joining in so we'll close this session session now and uh, uh, have a great evening. Thanks all. Thank you, Abhisheka. Abhisheka and Amrita. Thanks to Misha for helping out in the background. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And we'll share all these links again on the record, the, the recording that gets uploaded on the YouTube. So there will be all the relevant links and WhatsApp uh, group link, everything that will be available there. It would be uploaded immediately on uh, the YouTube channel. So, yeah, you can check that out.